Namaste. Good evening to everyone in India. Good morning and good afternoon in various countries. It's a wonderful day today. This is the eve of the International Day of Climate Action, which is every year celebrated on 24th of October. But let me tell you a word of caution in India. Where I'm sitting, the AQI close by is 182. It has improved from very poor to poor. The average in Delhi is around 230. And if I drive 100 kilometers away, I would be meeting 316. These are the times we live in. These are the times we face. These are the times we are keeping for our children. What is going to happen? How are we going to face it in times to come? Well, these are occasions when we sit together and think about it, mull the problems and also deliberate the solutions. And that is perhaps the purpose of when we talk about climate days, because that is focused on creating awareness amongst people that they have to take over the responsibility. It is not the elected governments who have the solutions. It is not the research bodies alone. It is not the social impact trust like Lung Care Foundation. It is not the clean air funds of the world to take the responsibility. We all have to take this responsibility. And that is why we are here today at this national webinar where people are also participating from various countries. I'm glad today that we have the privilege of having Jane with us, who shall be delivering our keynote address. We also would be listening to Dr. Professor Arvind Kumar, and he would be looking at things from a medical perspective in terms of how complicated the situation is getting with the advent of pandemic of COVID with air pollution and what kind of this deadly mocktail and cocktail is going to have in terms of an impact on the public. And then today, we have a very, very illustrious panel from the corporate India, who shall be looking in terms of what kind of a corporate reset is needed, what kind of the unfinished agenda we have inherited, and what kind of an agenda we need to be functioning on. This is going to be a fast-paced 100 minutes of deliberations. People would be in a position to ask us questions also in the later part of the session. But before we go ahead on that, I will be taking two minutes only to take you through the journey of five years of Lung Care Foundation so that you would be familiar with what kind of work we have done so far. And I hope everyone can see this slide. Yes. We started in yeah. 2015. Dr. Arvind Kumar used to feel very, very sad looking at all the black lungs he had been operating upon. And one fine day he said, enough is enough. And we all echoed, enough is enough, let's do something. And at night itself, we decided that we are going to start Lung Care Foundation. And within one week, we became functional. Initially, the first one and a half years were very, very baby steps, where we started looking in terms of creating a future force to be aware of and look after their responsibility because elders were failing in their duties. And we started with even very small kids to focus on happy, healthy lungs. But the major turnaround came when we created the Guinness World Record on 23rd of December, 2017. The world took notice of us. More than 114 media organizations covered us. And that's the time when we were catapulted into a much bigger league. And since the time, there is no way to look back. Today, we work with all kind of people, especially the doctors, with a very high commitment through Doctors for Clean Air campaign, where the medical associations of India are working shoulder to shoulder with us. We have various programs, Doctors for Clean Air, 
we have a special program in Delhi and NCR called SHAN, S-H-A-N, Saaf, Hawa, or Nagrik. We have the huge force of students in various cities of India who run clubs in their schools called Best Clubs, Breathe Easy, Stay Tough. We have programs where we help poor patients in terms of their lungs treatment. We have asthma response manuals created in 12 Indian languages available for free download on our website, also available in the printed form. We have videos for patients. We have programs with corporates, which we are talking about back to ABC, agenda for action for better, cleaner air. We work with bodies like institutions, development sector, enterprises, and academicians. We have a very strong research base. And recently we also launched programs to help the patient's assistants and relatives to take care of home care of patients who are suffering with lung ailments because even that area after the patient goes back home, how to look after them is important. The last slide during COVID time was actually a very, very busy time for all of us. We, during the last six months have held 59 events over half a million people have been covered by us. We have touched people in 26 countries. We have held South Asia meets. And even today, we have over 700 people registered to attend, participate, and learn from all the experts. This has been the brief journey of Lung Care Foundation. But we still feel these are our baby steps. We have a long way to go and more and more people shall be joining us in times to come so that we create much bigger success stories. And in this journey, the kind of help Jane and her organization has provided us, we actually fold our hands and convey our thanks and gratitude to the organization for the support they have given to us. And I'm sure in times to come, this is going to multiply. Today, Jane, we have the honor of the who's who of corporate world sitting here as leaders and who shall be also discussing in terms of what can be done in times to come. I understand you have a very limited time and we have promised you that you shall be relieved very, very quickly. So let me uh, invite you. And before I invite you, let me tell our audience very briefly about you. Jane Burston is the executive director and founder of the Clean Air Fund. She is responsible for defining the Clean Air Fund strategy. It partnership with the board, team, and partners, and leading the organization to implement the strategy. Jane previously led climate and energy science in the UK government, responsible for the UK green gas inventory and a 45 million pound science program. Prior to that, as head of energy and environment at the National Physical Laboratory, she managed a team of over 150 scientists working in air quality, greenhouse gas measurement, and renewable energy. She has been named as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum, as one of the 40 under 40 European young leaders by Friends of Europe, and is a previous UK social entrepreneur of the year. Wonderful, Jane, a lot of inspiration from you. And we look forward to listening to your wisdom so that we can take this program forward further. Over to Jane, please. Oh, well, thank you so much for your kind introduction. And actually the thanks all go to, to you all and your hard work for um, many, many years on championing this topic and bringing together, especially businesses now at this critical time. Um, apologies that I have to leave the discussion before the panel starts due to a prior commitment, but I really look forward to hearing the outcomes of your discussion. Um, I was going to cover three different things in the talk. Um, the COVID pandemic obviously has not only had vast and devastating effects on people's health and livelihoods, it's also really shone a light on the importance of tackling air pollution because of the health impact that I know that Dr. Kumar is going to talk through uh, later on this call. Um, and because increasing research is, is linking air pollution exposure, prior air, air pollution exposure to increased risk and severity of COVID-19 as well. Um, but also because of the changes and potential changes in public perception 
that we've had due to COVID. Um, I think everybody knows that COVID lockdowns around the world have shown people that bluer skies and cleaner air are possible. Um, and they're possible pretty much almost overnight. Um, people have also seen the impact that concerted collection, collective action can have. Um, and we know that people are really concerned. Um, the Clean Air Fund ran a few surveys in the early weeks of lockdown to find out is air pollution still a concern for people now that they are seeing blue skies and especially because other bigger worries have come up like infectious dis diseases. And we were very interested to see that that we surveyed um, air quality as a public health issue ranked top or second from top after infectious disease. Um, so, you know, the time is really ripe to, uh, to look at this in more detail and especially from the cor corporate sector where employees are going to be concerned about air pollution and customers are going to be concerned. And because of this focus at the moment on economic build back and the part that clean air action can play in saving not just government's money, but saving businesses money as well. So I was gonna cover um, three lists of three things um, on the premise that the lists of three are much more easy to remember than anything else. So first of all, three reasons why businesses should care about air pollution at this time. Secondly, three things that businesses are already doing on this topic. And then I'll end with three ways that you could think about getting involved. And I'm sure the panel discussion will um, come up with many, many more reasons than those to do something and many more potential ideas for action. So first of all, why is it relevant to business? Um, well, I think everybody has heard of the statistics about air pollution weakening the economy, um, most notably through increased national healthcare costs. Um, there was a report out from the Health Effects Institute that I know many people um, involved in public health in India were involved in as well. And um, that showed that last year, just PM 2.5 alone um, caused just under a million deaths in India. And air pollution now contributes to more disease uh, in most places in the world, including in India, than tobacco use. So several people have calculated the cost to India's economy, um, and especially the, the health and social care services. I think the most recent statistic is $150 billion a year because of the high, high burden of disease. Um, and there are some economic sectors that are affected as well that are, often aren't included in those calculations. Um, yields of solar panels, for example, go down um, in periods of high air pollution. Crop yields can go down. Obviously, sectors like tourism are very heavily affected when pollution is high. So number one reason to care is it really affects the economy overall. Number two reason that businesses should care is the air pollution, um, whatever business that you work in, is making your employees less healthy and your workforce therefore less productive. Um, the, there are some very interesting statistics, even on the short term impact of uh, high levels of air pollution. There's been a few studies done in China, for example, in um, call centers or in factories where the productivity of workers is very easy to measure. And um, even small increases in air pollution within the building um, have very marked effects, percentage point decreases in the productivity of employees. And then we all know that over the longer term, the health impacts of air pollution mean that workers can be off sick um, or they have to stay home to look after sick children. Um, and that means people, people can't come into work. So, um, you know, focusing on those costs, we recently did a study in the UK with the Confederation of British Industry, looking at, you know, the burden of cost that businesses take on, because that's often not in these calculations about costs to the overall economy, which tend to focus on healthcare costs. Um, what we found was in the UK, um, which is obviously only about 60, 60 million people, 3 million working days a year were lost because of air pollution and um, 1.6 billion pounds could be saved every single year 
if the UK dropped air pollution levels to in line with World Health Organization guidelines. So really, really big numbers. And that's the hit that businesses are taking. That's uh, you know, pe people who can't show up to work. Um, it, it's in addition to the massive health and social care cost savings. So the third reason um, why businesses should care is all of the other intangibles, you know, um, the effects on your customers, which is quite hard to measure. Maybe you can't send sales teams out at certain times of the year because it's not possible to travel. Um, we've seen articles about how um, major multinational businesses are really struggling to att attract or retain top global talent because uh, to, to polluted cities around the world, either because they have to pay a premium for them or because people can choose where to live and they're choosing not to work in the more polluted cities. So um, what are businesses already doing about this? Well, I mean, th there are huge amounts that, that's already going on. Obviously, there's a lot more that could be done, but I want to congratulate some of the businesses on this call because I know that people are making big efforts to lead um, and take a lead on this conversation. Um, one of the main ways that businesses are getting involved is by collectively calling for more action and getting together to plan action. Um, and an example is um, the Confederation of Indian Industries CEO Forum for Clean Air, um, which has already got the signatories of 28 leading Indian companies um, to a declaration for clean air, which commits those businesses um, to doing certain actions and to getting together to make sectoral plans. Um, secondly, businesses, um, you know, we, we, it was mentioned that we're, we're on the eve of um, a focus on climate change and businesses all over India are focused on reducing their emissions. Um, just last month, I saw that a coalition of six industry majors in India um, have signed up to an industry charter for near zero emissions by 2050. Um, and if you're involved in that huge congratulations, it's a massive leap forward. Um, and I would encourage other businesses to sign up to that. And thirdly, um, there are lots of different ways in which corporations are showing that they can be part of the solution. So we've seen, for example, Cummins in India supporting clean air act action in Maharashtra through tree planting drives. IKEA has started a small pilot project to buy crop stubble from farmers and turn that either into a renewable energy source or into a material that they're making uh, products like straw mats from. And um, internationally, we've seen uh, organizations like Google use the assets that they have um, and what their company is known for to push forward the cause of air pollution. So Google, for example, is installing regulatory grade air pollution monitors into street view vehicles so they can map air pollution as they drive around um, and you know if, if that could if, if all google maps could end up having air pollution levels on well i think that that would be a huge step forward um, so it's quite clear that working on clean air provides an opportunity for leadership um, in cleaning up your own act but also in thinking creatively about how to use the assets of your business and also your voice as well-respected employers to support change. So I wanted to, to leave you with three ideas for actions for how you can be part of that change. Um, like I say, these, these are only kind of seed ideas and I know that the panel will have many better ones. Um, but just to start you, start you off. Um, first of all, I mentioned the Confederation of Indian Industries CEO Forum for Clean Air. Um, I would encourage businesses that are part of CIAI to join that, to sign the declaration and uh, to both support and share best practice and also to benefit from the best practice that your peers and colleagues are sharing on that platform. Secondly, um, to reduce emissions, uh, to include measurement and reporting of your emissions in greenhouse gas accounting, be transparent with stakeholders um, and encourage your um, supply chain to do the same thing. And thirdly, to think about how to use your assets creatively. I mean, some businesses are going to be providing directly the solutions um, to the problem that we have, either providing renewable energy um, 
or uh, electric vehicles, or the many other ways in which air pollution can be reduced. But even if you're not in one of those sectors that's directly providing products to reduce pollution, I'd encourage you to think, you know, as the businesses we mentioned um, before have, how, how can I get involved um, with the assets that I do have to improve air quality? So I uh, just wanted to finish by saying thank you so much for um, your interest, for everybody who's joined the call and um, good luck in the steps that you're taking to clean the air. Thank you very much, Jane, for your wonderful uh, three ideas. And I especially would like to also reconfirm the three pointers. Your talk was I insightful. Second, your talk was inspiring. And third, you talked about implementable ideas. This has been a wonderful input. Thank you very much. And I wish by using your good offices, you may like to do a similar kind of research in India. And we can assure you, we'll assist you, we'll help you out. Because if UK is losing 1.6 billion pounds in India, also the cost which we may have to bear would be much more. So with your help, I'm sure in times to come, we should be in a position to do this kind of research which could also create ways for more implementable actions and not just creating only the alerts. Thank you so much. And Thank I wish so if you could stay back, but then we would be, uh, I mean, we all are very, very thankful to you for squeezing your time at a very, very short notice and joining us. Thank you so Thank much. You. You. God bless your family, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time and inspirational words, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great discussion. Thank you. And you have a great evening. Now we move over to Dr. Arvind Kumar, my big brother. He's the founder and managing trustee of Lung Care Foundation. He's presently the chairman, Center for Chest Surgery, Sir Gangaram Hospital. Earlier, he was professor of surgery at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He's also currently the director of robotic surgery at Sir Gangaram, Gangaram Hospital and has more than 35 years of experience of operating on people. And that is what disturbed him the most in terms of creating Lung Care Foundation. He's a pioneer in chest surgery in India with largest experience of open, keyhole, and robotic chest surgery. He's leading many educational and research initiatives in chest care across India with over 100 publications in national and international journals. Dr. Arvind Kumar, has recently been conferred with the prestigious Dr. B.C. Roy Award for Eminent Medical Person of the Year 2014 by the then President of India, Dr. Pranab Mukherjee. Over to Arvind, please. Uh, thank you, Rajiv, uh, for those very kind words. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, First of all, thank you very much to each of you for accepting this uh, request to start this unique and to my mind, first of its kind initiative where a medical organization or a medically oriented social impact trust and the corporate world are coming together and aiming to at least do a little bit work towards solving the problem of clean air. And now my task in next 18 to 20 minutes is to just share with you the kind of impact this problem is having on our health. And the reason why some of you might have heard this talk earlier, you might find it uh, boring, repetitive also, I beg your pardon. But the reason why we kept this talk is that a lot of people, and that's been my experience after having traveled across the country and met large number of people, lot of people are still not aware of the magnitude and the depth of the damage. And unfortunately, that includes a large number of doctors also who are only superficially aware of what damage it is causing. So always we start our presentation with this talk just to give you an idea about how severe, how serious 
is this problem and how much the cost of inaction is going to be in terms of not damage to us but damage to our next generation whom we claim to love and for whom we do everything that we do today we breathe 25000 times a day inhaling 10000 liters of air when i was in school i was taught that contents of air are oxygen nitrogen and some inert gases unfortunately these days when children are taught about contents of air they are taught about particulate matter or pm which is divided into 10 2.5 <laughs> and 1 according to its micron size and various gases which are there as pollutants range from carbon dioxide sox nox monoxide uh, various other things including ozone and these unfortunately are increasing in amount continuously human hair is about 50 micron in size so you can imagine how small a pm 2.5 particle size will be and a term you would often hear is called air quality index many people confuse air quality index with pm 2.5 so air quality index is a is a term is a is a is a number which is derived by a complex algorithm which takes into consideration the levels of six pollutants pm 2.5 is one of them it also includes pm 10 and various other toxic gases so levels of six major pollutants are put together into an algorithm to reach the the amount of the level of toxicity overall toxicity of that air and this number is ranging from 0 to 300 plus 0 to 50 on the left hand side being good and on the right hand side being unhealthy very unhealthy and hazardous and i am very very sorry to inform that our city and a large parts of our country are most of the time on the right hand side of this sphere rather than on the left hand side many people say it's a problem confined to delhi only i want you to see this global map of population weighted average annual pm 2.5 concentrations and if you look at our country you would realize that 75 to 85 or even more than that is something which is present in almost the whole of our country more than 95% surface area of the country actually has bad air so it's wrong to say that it's a problem confined to delhi because of being capital delhi tends to get more uh, attention the only i i request you to see on the left hand side the only 10 countries with the lowest exposure are australia brunei canada estonia finland ireland new zealand norway sweden and denmark and we have 83.2 as our mean or average concentration across the country who permits less than 25 so you can imagine what is the state of air across the country and not just india does it affect health at all which organs of the body are affected since i was uh, uh, interested in doing leaving more time for for discussion i am not going specifically into each organ so i thought i will show you this picture which conveys which are the organs affected and if you start from the top the brain the eye the nose on the left hand side the heart the lung the liver gastrointestinal tract pancreas urogenital which means kidneys and bladder bone joints skin blood you you can see there is hardly any organ in the body which is not adversely impacted by air pollution so it's a miss is a wrong in notion that people have that at worst air pollution only affects our lungs most of the people i speak to including large number of doctors believe that air pollution only impacts or harms lungs the fact is it harms our brain including the brain of growing young children it harms our heart causes higher incidence of hypertension and heart attacks it impacts lungs where of course it causes large number of diseases it also impacts pancreas which is now being considered to be responsible for rising incidence of diabetes in india which is making india the diabetes capital of the world 
and it is also affecting bone, blood, and joints, leading to higher incidence of these problems. In fact, what is happening is that every year there is more and more research emerging, which is contributing. Uh, I mean, which is alleging pollution to be a cause of an increasing number of diseases, which were earlier attributed to different causes. And as Rajiv mentioned, this actually was the reason for the start of Lung Care Foundation. As a chest surgeon, I've been opening chest since I started this in 1988 at All India Institute. Earlier, I used to see pink lungs. This is the on the left hand side, pink. This is the kind of lungs we are born with, which I also used to see way back in 80s and early 90s. But in the last 10 years, I don't think I have ever seen this kind of lung in any patient, including, and I repeat, including, unfortunately, teenagers. Even when I operate on teenagers, I find a large number of black flag deposits. And a typical Delhiite would have this kind of lung. And if you happen to be a smoker also, it could actually be worse than this. Now, what impact does it have? Well. Lot, lot of data you would hear. The, the, this is a global snapshot. Overall, more than 7 million deaths in 2019. Nearly 500,000 infant, infant deaths in the first month of life. Uh, 43 microgram is the population weighted annual average 2.5 concentration. More than 4.14 million deaths are due to outdoor pollution and 2.31 is indoor. Now you would wonder why am I dividing them into outdoor and indoor? So outdoor air pollution is also known as ambient air pollution, is the ambient air which is there inside, which is a typical problem of cities or other modern cities or big cities. But when you go to rural areas where unfortunately this practice of using solid fuel as burning, cooking and cooking in an open room and everybody including the children and pregnant mothers and elderly people being in that room is still popular where a large number of deaths occur because that smoke which comes out of the chula has PM 2.5 in the range of about 20,000 micrograms per meter cube and little children sit around that chula inhaling their air which is what leads to millions of deaths of children in the first two, three years of life. And this is a picture instead of showing, going into every organ, I, would, I have condensed all that into this. So if you start from the left-hand side, nearly 40% of COPD. Now COPD is the, uh, is the disease where the lungs get damaged. You're not able to take in air and you ultimately die because of air hunger because lungs cannot absorb oxygen. 40% of that is contributed by air pollution. Now it is being said 20% of diabetes deaths, 20% of heart attack deaths, over 20% of lung cancer deaths, more than one fourth of deaths due to paralysis or brain stroke, more than 30% of deaths because of the pneumonia. And most sadly, most sadly, over 20% of deaths occurring in our newborns now are being attributed to air pollution. So you can see starting from causing deaths of our newborns to causing deaths because of lung diseases, it's causing havoc, it's causing devastating effect, impact on the health of people. And I dare say that in our country, there is no non-smoker. I don't smoke cigarette, but I cannot claim myself to be a non-smoker. Because in terms of damage to lungs and other organs, 22 microgram of PM 2.5 is equal to one cigarette. So if your city has an average uh, PM 2.5 of about 150, 180, you are smoking seven to eight cigarettes per day. And this unfortunately starts from the very first breath of your life. The moment a baby is out of the mother's womb and takes his or her first breath, he or she inhales the same air. And if the PM 2.5 is 220, the newborn becomes a smoker of 10 cigarettes from the first breath of his or her life. So we have newborn smokers in our country.
maybe you will find it too radical a statement but i challenge anyone to prove me wrong if you are inhaling an air with 220 microgram per meter cube pm 2.5 which in terms of damage is equal to 8 to 10 cigarettes so that newborn is inhaling damage equal to 8 to 10 cigarettes so if i say that we have a newborn smoker what's wrong with that what age does it start everybody thought that this starts this occurs in the adult age then we realized that it's actually impacting the newborns and now a most shocking research has emerged which has shown these toxins to be present in the placenta which is the layer which connects a growing child baby to the mother's womb and those toxins have been shown in the placenta which means that they are crossing the placenta and growing going into the newborn new into the growing baby which means that the damage actually starts even before we are born now this is the most sad part the moment your life starts inside your mother womb mother's womb the damage also starts unborn babies children elderly the most that they grow and this is the saddest part of our country a mother cooking on the chula and a little baby inhaling 20000 micrograms per meter cube 25000 times a day because this smoke it stays inside the room there is no exhaust and this is what leads to a huge number of pneumonia deaths in under 5 population in our rural areas and in the cities it is now being proved to be causing lower iq in children and accelerated aging in the elderly so if i was as a doctor i was to sum up all these i would say air pollution is a national health emergency and we in lung care foundation have this triple a approach that let's make people aware when they are aware they will be awakened and when they are awakened they will definitely action towards solving this problem now few words about link between covid so rajiv how much time do i have sorry i didn't you can carry time. on another 3 4 minutes no issues okay. i'll i'll finish in 3 4 minutes so yeah. just uh, uh, warn me when 4 minutes are up so there sure. is now lot of evidence available which points at two facts i won't go into details of these studies i will summarize there are two things which there is a study from harvard there is there are a lot of studies from england there are studies from italy there are studies from china and there are also studies done in india now what have these studies shown just two sentences i will summarize pollution impacted communities pollution impacted areas are reporting much higher per population incidence of covid what is incidence incidence is number of cases per unit population so which means a pollution impacted community has higher chance of people acquiring covid but that's not all that's only part one of the story the serious part of the story is not only are more people getting infection but once they get infection there is a much higher chance of death now this was the startling revelation which came out of the harvard study which said that if you are living in a area with high pm 2.5 you have 8 to 10% higher chance of dying than all other factors remaining the same than if you came from a area with normal pm 2.5 so what is the link between covid and air pollution air pollution is going to lead to higher incidence of covid and is going to lead to higher mortality rate now this is what actually frightens me as a doctor that now we are approaching the annual pollution festival which starts towards the end of october november december being the peak pollution months we still have 60000 cases of covid occurring in our country we have festivals approaching people are going to violate the social norms social distancing and mask norms there is going to be more pollution now this deadly cocktail what it's going to cause to covid it gives me nightmare so right. there is a huge amount of impact lot of people say oh solutions to pollution are going to be costly 
I wish to summarize by saying that the pollution, the impact of pollution, people talk in terms of death, but death is only the tip of the pyramid before a person dies. From the normal person stage to death, there is a huge distance that he travels. When he falls sick, he gets admitted, he goes to hospitals, his family is disturbed, he is disturbed, there is absenteeism from office of himself and the family members. And the cost of all that to the economy is far more than the cost of solving this problem and not letting that happen. So I would skip these and come to my last part, just two, three slides. So it's, a, it's actually not a presentation. Now, the last part is this. These two parts were the presentation, which is the medical part. Now is the emotional part. I want to use this platform to make a very emotional, very personal appeal to the corporate world. There are two options that we have. Either we sit back and continue our business as usual. Oh, hum kya kar sakte hai? what can we do? Or we take notice of it that it's not us who are getting affected. It's our next generation which is getting affected. And how can we let our next generation be destroyed by the impact of what our forefathers have done and what we are continuing to do today? So we respond to this national health emergency and do everything that it takes to achieve clean air, which I think is a fundamental human right. Choice is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Arvind Kumar. As usual, your talk was soul searching. And in fact, I was counting my breath because the way things are, we really need to take charge and think in terms of what our targets could be and how do we work backwards. Time now that we get on with our panel discussions. And let me explain the format for the next one hour. This is going to be like a T20 tournament with in between also bringing in some rules of one day. We'll be moving faster. The scoring rate will be high. We would like to cover lot many grounds and we have five illustrious CEOs who shall be sharing their experiences and their thinking together. And incidentally, they come from diverse fields and therefore symbolically they represent all kinds of corporate world in India itself. But before that, for the audience, if you wish to ask questions, kindly look below. There is a Q&A tab. Put your question only in the Q&A tab. And if you make, wish to make a generic comment, you can also write in the chat box. But kindly avoid saying hello, hi, etc because that may distract others. And it is not necessary that I may be in a position to pick up all your questions or give credit to your question. I may be in a position to club some of the questions. And today, for a change, kindly do not ask a medical question for Dr. Arvind Kumar, because as in the past, he's always flooded with those medical questions. But today, we'll be talking about Corporate India, Agenda Reset, and of course, I'll be requesting Dr. Arvind Kumar to be part of the panel so that in some of the things where even my panelists would like to ask a question to Dr. Arvind Kumar, they would be at liberty to do so because this is not going to be a hardcore television debate. This is going to be a conversation amongst the corporate leaders and they shall be bringing about their perspectives. One more announcement. Uh, many of you were keen in terms of receiving an e-certificate. So towards the end of the program, a link shall be shared. Fill up, click the link, fill up the details, and you will be receiving your e-certificates by the middle of the next week itself. But make sure that you write your spellings correctly and your email correctly. Check and recheck. Because at times when they are not entered correctly, some of you may not even receive it or some of you may receive an incorrect certificate. So kindly just pay a little more attention to that. So now let me introduce the illustrious panel before I start shooting my questions to them. Let me have the honor of 
introducing Mr. Rajiv Anand first. Mr. Rajiv Anand is the non-executive chairman of Goodyear India Limited. Prior to this, he held the position of chairman and managing director of Goodyear India Limited and Goodyear South Asia Tires Private Limited from 2009 to May 2020. And he's also a member of Directors Club board certification program run by the Hunt Partners. He has strong roots in manufacturing and operations. Rajiv comes in with a deep experience of over 39 years that runs from, mark these words, engine room to the boardroom of Goodyear India. He spent the last decade driving the PNL and the board of Goodyear. He is accredited with developing a strong and capable team, as well as establishing good systems and processes at the company and board level. Welcome, Mr. Rajiv Anand. Thank you. Thank you. Let me also have the privilege of introducing Mr. Anil Nair. Mr. Anil Nair is the Managing Director, Country Digitization, APJZC at Cisco Limited, uh, Cisco Systems. In his current role at Cisco, he is involved with government and industry leaders to accelerate national and digitization strategies across India, China, Australia, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, and Philippines. Anil has been the recipient of an award for professional excellence by the Indian Institution of Industrial Engineers and has won the Udyogratan Award from the Institute of Economic Studies. Welcome, Anil, to the show, please. Thank you so much for joining in. Let me also have the privilege of introducing Mr. Ashish Kumar Srivastava. Ashish is the Managing Director and CEO of PNB MetLife. He brings to the table an experience of over 26 years spanning across renowned national and global organizations, including MetLife Incorporated, Coca-Cola, Tata Group, HSBC, the Times of India Group, and IBL Group. Prior to taking charge as the Managing Director and CEO of PNB MetLife in March 2017, Ashish was a part of the MetLife Middle East and Africa management team. Ashish holds a postgraduate degree in personnel management. He has also attended advanced certificate courses at London Business School, Michigan Business School, and at Cornell University. Welcome, Ashish, to the show, please. Thank you so much for joining in. And uh, let me also introduce you to Mr. Amit Bhatia, who is the founder of Aspire Impact since 2007 and Aspire Circle since 2014. He was the inaugural CEO of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment during the period 2017 to 2020. He has been the founding CEO of India's Impact Investment Council founding CEO of WNS Knowledge Services and founder of McKinsey Knowledge Center. Amit, heartiest welcome to you for joining into this program, please. Thank you. And last but not the least, the person who's really helped me in terms of bringing all these friends here is Vijay Rai. Vijay Rai is the Chief Growth Officer and Executive Board Member of Day One Technologies, Asia Pacific Region, USA. He is a high impact leader, having worked in multiple industry sectors, recognized and awarded by eminent forums for his accomplishment in socio-economic sectors. Vijay is an inspirational change agent who aims to deliver impact through diversity, inclusion, AI-led innovation, skill-based education, and climate change. He's also a UN SDG catalyst, a passionate advocate of clean and green energy, and he is also the honorary patron of Lankier Foundation. Welcome, Vijay Ji. Time now to ask a few questions straight. But before I ask the questions to the panel, I have questions for all of you to answer. Let me conduct a quick poll. I'll ask you three very simple questions, and you will get precisely one minute to answer and that data may be used by our panelists also to discuss what our agenda could be. So here is the poll which I'm going to be sharing with you. This will have three parts and you can start answering right now. Question number one is, how do you view the role of corporate India vis-a-vis -vis the current state of air pollution? Your answers could be contributor, sufferer, both, 
or none of the above. Two, should corporate India bring about a major change in their strategy towards the management of air pollution in their day-to-day -day working, your answer could be yes, no, not sure. And the third question is, who should take responsibility in an organization to reduce the impact of air pollution? Top management, contributing department, all the employees, or none of the above? So let the panelists sit back and enjoy how the poll would emerge. Right now, 77 people have responded out of three, 235, 35% polling has happened. I'm talking more like the Election Commission of India. And very soon I shall be ending the poll and sharing the data before you. And let us see what kind of meaning do we draw out of that. Maybe that could be our opener in terms of how do we interpret the poll results. So let's move further. We are now reaching the 50% polling mark. 115 people have responded, 50% accomplished. Let me see how the results would be coming in the next 30 seconds. What people think about the role of corporate India. Some people are reading it perhaps once more. The earlier indications are that people are responding very well. They are responding it with a lot of maturity. And I'm sure this data could be quite interesting in terms of throwing the light in terms of how we could be looking at the future. So the time's over. And now let me look at how do we share our results. So let me just stop the sharing part and look at the results. Can the panelists see the results, please? Yeah. Yep. Let me read it out. How do you view the role of corporate India vis-a-vis -vis the current state of air pollution? They are the contributors, 27% feel. Corporate India is a sufferer, 6%. Corporate India is both contributor and a sufferer, 63%. None of the above, 5% people respond to that. That's an interesting thing. The second aspect, should Corporate India bring about a major change in their strategy towards the management of air pollution in their day-to-day -day working life? 89% people say yes. 11% people say not sure. And 1% people say, chal do jaisa chal hai. Corporate India is doing fine. And question number three, who should take responsibility in an organization to reduce the impact of air pollution? 24% top management and here are the top management professionals sitting and smiling at that figure. And then we 8% of the people say the contributing department and all employees is 66% and none of the above is 1%. So my initial 15 seconds response request for all the panelists, how do you look at this data? Not Rajiv, sir. <clears throat> I am not surprised because I also voted and I was part of all the three results. Okay. Exactly. Anil. I think right on the dot, everybody is responsible for it and leadership has to lead the way. Ashish. Yeah, so I, I, I think the corporate India should get actively involved and I think you know people are saying that, uh, agreeing to that. Amit. No, I agree with uh, everything. I think your audience is very mature, but they've been too generous with the leadership. <laughs> I think leadership cannot abdicate its responsibility, have to take on a greater role. Fine. So you're taking the pill, Amit. Vijay. I think the the call for, la call for action is urgent. I think the leaders have to lead the way, as Anil has said. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So let me start with my very first question. And let's start with the time the lockdown started around March 18th, 2020. And you know, when suddenly certain things come up, there are different types of reactions we go through. And their reactions are generally in three stages. Stage one, the shock and denial. 15 days, kya karenge ghar ke? Stage two, anger and depression. Why me? Why us? What's going to happen? And stage three, acceptance and integration. 
Now, this is an opening question which I would actually extend it to everyone, starting with Anil. How do you look at it, both from a personal perspective as well as a leader of the corporate? Yeah, Rajiv, and uh, in our case, you know, we are in the heart of digital change, you know, Cisco as a company, as an entity. And so working from home was no big change. It was fairly seamless transition at the organizational level because very often we are working from home. We are dealing with teams that are, that are placed internationally and it's a way of life for us. The important thing is that we were also using our own tools. Like for instance, what we use is, is WebEx, yes. which is our solution and uh, we continue to use it. And the, the usage rapidly increased, gave us an opportunity to be able to refine our tools and make it even better. If you look at um, the job that I do, I interact with all the countries that you named, about seven or eight of them in APJC. And it's way of life for us to be able to get together on the call, exchange notes, make sure that the system can take the transcripts, make sure that we can do the notation, we can share notes with each other and so on and so forth. And of course, the other task before us was to, was to make sure that other companies come on board, all our customers, and we supported them in this, uh, in this journey. And I must say that, that companies which have a digital transformation agenda made the change far easier, made the leap much faster. Back to you, Rajiv. Thanks. Ashish, but in your kind of a business, which is both digital also, but then a person-to-person -person contact is necessary. The sales team has to be on the ground. How did you face this? So thanks, Rajiv. I, I think very interesting question. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know, this is where I think some of our uh, notions got challenged. Uh, that uh, insurance is face-to-face, -face, you know, has to be sold, et cetera. Um, you know, so, so uh, as, as Anil said, you know, we, we, you know, given that MetLife is a global company, we had some uh, an advance notice in some sense, you know, because it hit China uh, before us and, uh, you know, we were, we learned from our China operations. Uh, so we had started our BCP uh, a little earlier than the lockdown, when the lockdown, you know, started uh, and, and then of course it, it got extended. Uh, the good thing is we've been investing in digital. So while we, uh, you know, honestly, we, you know, I, I think the, the change from uh, reaction to reimagination is what I call it. Uh, you know, that initial, there was some reaction and then it, you know, went into reimagination of how do we work. But the good thing is because we've been uh, investing in digital, uh, I'll just give you a quick example in April. So normally we do around 24, 25,000 policies a month. In April, in the in complete, during complete lockdown, we logged in 24,000 policies. Oh. So, so the transition was, uh, was quick. And as I said, you know, we quickly went into reimagination. Rajiv. That, that's a wonderful answer, reaction to reimagination. But uh, Rajivji, you know, digitally you can design a tire, but you have to physically make it and move it also. What has been your experience? Yeah, it's <clears throat> uh, thanks, Rajiv. Uh, a great viewpoint from different sectors, but ours is more manufacturing. And unfortunately, the connect with the customer and physical uh, connect and delivery of the product on the spot, changing of the tires has to happen. So I think we were impacted the most as manufacturing uh, industry and <clears throat> the kind of product we are dealing with. Uh, I think uh, we have lost. Yeah, 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 Rajiv ji. I think we momentarily lost you. Could you continue, please? Can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. So I said end-to-end -end supply chain was impacted and there was no point for us to continue to manufacture and create inventory. So we had to shut down. And when we started back sometime, I think in middle of May, when we started back, uh, we ramped up quite quickly. And uh, what we have seen is due to certain, uh, I would say pent up demand in the market for, especially in the farm sector, 
we have seen that the uh, takeoff has been very very rapid and very smooth we are almost uh, you know utilizing the capacity full so that has been a, a very positive sign though the auto sector as a whole is still catching up still almost closing to the near covid pre covid levels the other interesting part was uh, of the question if i may take another few seconds sure that during the period between march 15th to let's say or march 20th when actually the first lockdown happened until middle of may when we started back like uh, uh, most of my uh, colleagues or friends said that it was transition we didn't know you also said that it was like a sudden shock <clears throat> what to do we utilize that period to connect with our uh, not only our own associates our own employees on a very regular basis with certain targeted programs and sessions we also utilize that time on customer management okay we connected with them and we did some uh, very in, not only informative but actually value added programs for them online and uh, made sure that they are connected to us all the time so that time was utilized constructively though there was no other business but of course i think this will have a very very long term benefit to the organization wonderful so like your tire you ensured that the movement remained smoother let me just change the gear and come to amit amit there are a lot of jargons which are used in the industry new normal next normal reset Now, if you look, really look at all these jargons which have been played around, how do you see the future for the industry in India? And uh, if you were to do some crystal ball gazing for the next six months to twenty-four months, how do you think situation may happen? And is there a systematic change in the offing? Uh, thanks, Rajiv, and you know. for your audience it's important whether we like it or not unfortunately the worst is not behind us it's still ahead of us as far as the business world is concerned dr arvind will totally agree with you on this amit yeah. yeah. the corporate sector perhaps with the exception of segments in tech telecom where there was some growth you know as the world tried to get you know used to this new way of functioning i think much of the global business sector and india too has to build back to pre covid levels with significantly more regard for the environment but significantly less resources because everyone suffered it over this 9 months now i think very recently imf was heard saying it will take 2 years for countries like india to get back to pre covid level and i have heard from sectors like airlines and hotel and tourism that it will take at least 4 years just to get back to pre covid levels not to build on that now most importantly all this is complicated you know because anyway pre covid the world was catapulting to what we call an impact economy an evolution of sustainability so i think if i was to do crystal ball gazing i would put my finger on three trends we are likely to see next 2 to 4 years or 5 years one due to sdgs countries and corporations will need to find how their future investments can be aligned with sustainable and impact goals and you will see new professions and new jobs being born chief impact officers impact specialists and this is going to be a trend because corporations will have to change behavior i think second because of this imminent impact economy and will maybe later we'll get time to talk about their new impact accounting rules that are coming into motion you know there are today only about 500 indian companies that actually report uh, and they are required to do so by sebi you know on environment on sustainability that's actually growing to about 100 odd companies a thousand companies from next april now this is going to be a new trend with corporations they are going to be forced into doing something they were not used to impact assessment impact reports you know and and you know and i must add this is something which you know aspire specializes in so that's a big trend you'll see and the third and final trend you'll see is due to fear of more pandemics air pollution global warming there'll be need for greater education greater awareness at all levels right from schools universities to working professionals 
and you'll see much more investment getting made and you're already doing a great service to that cause because you can't address a problem until you understand it. So I think overall these trends are going to converge to actually a more systemic change and the world has already given it a name and they are calling this impact capitalism, a whole new impact economy, which is gonna transform countries like ours into impact republics of the future. Thank you so much, that's very well put. In fact, Lankier Foundation during the last five years has been doing a major work, especially with the school children and now with the college students also, so that they become partners because I generally speak at the conferences when elders say that, sorry, we are leaving a bad word. And I say, hey, you are not leaving the world, you're still here. It is important that if you create the bad world, you clean up the bad world. It is not the responsibility of the younger generation to clean the mess that you have created. The younger generation will participate, but it is the, still the responsibility of all the elders to take the lead and participate and even be led by the younger generation to do the cleanup. Wonderfully said, uh, Amit. But uh, Anil, how do you view what Amit has added in terms of the crystal ball gazing? Anil, um, I think uh, the video is frozen. Uh, Vijay, would you like to add something to this conversation, please? Yeah, sure. I think it was uh, interesting to hear from uh, our co-panelists. Uh, you see, uh, in India, we are no longer a stranger to this concept of air pollution because uh, the AQI levels would have touched, I think, 1,000, if I'm not wrong. And that would be an alarming situation and call for action for all of us. But I think whether it is through industry-related toxic emissions, whether it is transportation, whether it is burning of garbage, or plastics or construction work, air pollution is something which has now become a little more dangerous. Because at the pre, uh, what we have seen pre-pandemic levels, the air pollution at the pre-pandemic levels were below 50. And no one could have imagined that we would be reaching that kind of a figure ever in India. Of course, we need to take long, uh, bigger kind of resolutions and uh, greater targets to reduce. And I think it starts with individuals, I think person level. As, as we keep talking about individual social responsibility, the first thing starts and I feel is awareness. We have seen this twin problem which we have, no one has seen ever in this world. Of course, many pandemics would have happened, but one of the problem is what we call, like we call in digital, digital twins, we would call it was a twin problem, saving lives. And on the other side were the livelihoods. So that was the key concern for all of us. And of course the 2020 now, as we talk, of course, business continuity planning for all of us, everybody who's working, you see migrant labor, you see the problems associated with kind of panic reactions, the fear. So everywhere you see people were kind of, you know, very, very stressed because of this fact that what's going to happen because there's no medicine, there's no cure for this so far. So the, the debate has now shifted. The focus has shifted towards pandemic. And now this has kind of accelerated the problem in a greater magnitude. But what we really need to talk about here are that the problem is large but how do we really not only react to the problem, but how do we become proactive and take some radical steps and targets to not only get kind of you know, excited by the data points or get bothered or stressed by the data points, but take some radical action and kind of robust targets, both at the society level, at the business level and at the government level. So all these three stakeholders need to come together to really work together to see that the problem statement is big, but what is that we are going to do to mitigate the problems? And final is that the problem is not yet over. So the worst is still to come. If we do not act now, we will never be able to create a legacy for our future generations, because if you are not able to breathe and if you're not able to be uh, on a positive side of the health, this health emergency has already become an economic emergency globally. So the entire world is in a crisis mode. The call for action right now is much more than ever. So I look forward to other people adding more sure. value and working together on this. Thank you very much, Vijay. That was a very good drive from you. Uh, 
you. You know, last year around this time, there was a front page news in London that PM ten was twenty five. Particulate matter ten was twenty five. It made the front page news. Near Diwali time, Delhi NCR had a PM ten of two thousand six hundred, and it was never newsworthy. Two thousand six hundred compared to twenty five in London. Now people like I mean Rajiv, Anil, Ashish with all kind of international exposure, Amit, Vijay. How do you look at corporates in those countries? Viewing such kind of readings, vis-a-vis -vis corporates in India, in terms of really getting alarmed because the situation which Amit and Vijay are talking about are not a rosy picture, and situations are going from bad to worse. How those country corporates have handled it, and what kind of lessons should we draw and work towards in India, Rajiv? Please. Yeah, uh, I I think it is very interesting. uh point of view and a question and a a problem to solve you are absolutely right last almost couple of years now and i remember 3 years ago it started then last year last to last year and last year all 3 years this problem around diwali caused industries to shut down now this is a big loss of uh, what you say revenue to the industries so it, first of all what it does when you shut down an industry in a particular region because of air pollution the impact of that is not only to the industry itself not only to the associates or employees with your competitors you are actually on a back foot you are losing now the market share so this becomes a non sustainable Uh, issue for that particular industry or organization what is the impact of that it is not a short term simple impact limited to that company it goes to the corporate especially in case of multinationals when you go back to the corporate or the principals and the management and you ask for more capital you ask for expansion you ask for more money to be spent you give them whole lot of rosy picture about the market and the need for the product and you can you have a market you can sell you can increase your market share but then comes this pollution issue and then comes this forced shutdown of the company for 15 days 20 days 30 days how do you justify that so we have faced that we are part of that situation so to answer that question uh, first of all this brings us to the first forcing strategy that we have to do something about it as corporates or as society that this is a compulsion now there is there is no choice left anymore the second is what dr kumar said i was very very scared when he showed the data on the newborn the infants in the womb itself are we as a society behaving like a uh, uh, you know a really like responsible society seniors where are we going to end this society are we going to be sustainable as a society or as a nation forget about the world forget i am just talking about india do i really want to stay in gurgaon or in delhi or around delhi the answer is no i am from a very small city called karnal which is of course not very good as compared to delhi now but back in my time 40 years ago or 15 20 years ago it was it is still a better city from living standpoint versus delhi i don't want to stay here so question is for corporate india is there a choice my answer the short answer is there is no choice are we doing enough the answer is within the now there are two types of pollution docs have talked about managing the internal pollution which is in house or inside the industry and one is environmental outside are we doing enough for in house answer is yes we are very very uh, concerned about effluent treatment we are very concerned about what we are uh, where we are getting caught we are meeting the norms or emission norms or not 
we are very concerned about our own employees because of the medical cost and the absenteeism cost and business disruption. Business continuity is a big, big department in most of the multinationals. It is headed by some corporate, very senior people. The teams are there. Could they have really predicted a pandemic causing a disruption to this level in 2020? Answer is no. Was there a mitigation plan ever thought of? Answer is no. But going forward, if these kind of pandemics and air pollution is continuously going to be high, I think we will, as a corporate, if we, our contribution is more than 30-40% to the pollution causing industries, we have to work on substitution. We have to find uh, solutions which are scientific engineering solutions so that we do our part, not only within the industry, but also where we impact the society. So I think we have no choice. We have reached a stage where as corporate good citizens, most of our CSR funds and other cost and the budget should be highly focused towards these kind of activities. Very well said, yeah. very profound. But Anil, would you like to add something to this, please? Rajiv, I dropped in the middle. The bandwidth was a problem. So you'll have to repeat the question. No, we are talking in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what we could be learning from the corporate okay. world across the okay. globe and lessons for okay. India. Sure. So one of the things that, that I do as part of my job is work with uh, industry, government and academia. So I sure. think that enriches the discussion. Sure. And uh, I see many of the companies that operate in, in many countries, multinationals, operate that way where they look at government. Your voice is breaking again, Anil. Let me let me just come back to you, Ashish. Would you like to add quickly in this discussion, uh, Rajiv, please? Can I can I just uh, make a small sure, comment? Sure, 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 Arvind. I I really want to congratulate uh, Mr. Rajiv for his such a bold statement and acceptance yeah. of the magnitude and the depth of the problem that there is no choice. And uh, I really congratulate you. I head off to you, yeah. sir. What I wish I wish this kind of an attitude is reflected across the corporate world that it's not a question of should we do it, uh, when will we do, or we'll see, we'll see. No, if we don't do it today, we have no tomorrow. And I'd just like to add that what we are discussing here, what I have described are the ill effects of air pollution. There is an even bigger menace, which is climate change which also has health impacts apart from huge economic and other impacts, which we have not talked about at, at all. And if you combine this menace of climate change, air pollution, both of which have same causative factors, the impact will be even worse. And I really congratulate Mr. Rajiv for actually making such a bold statement that it's time that we need to reinvent the entire process and look for alternatives, not as a routine, but as an emergency measure. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. Over to you, Rajiv. Thank you, Arvind. Arvind, incidentally, it is not only Mr. Rajiv, because he definitely takes the cake right now, but these are all the five CEOs who were bold enough to come on this platform. Vijay knows it very well that when we were trying to invite a lot of people, we had a much bigger failure rate because the majority of them were not even willing to come on stage with us. And many of them even told us, we have no bandwidth or we need to take permission from their bosses somewhere outside before they come here on the panel. So we must compliment all the five panelists who have dared to come here and are they're talking their heart out in terms of what could be the responsibility of the corporate world. And we must actually compliment all so five Rajiv, of them together. Before, here. You, before you clap, I stand corrected. And along <laughs> with Mr. Rajiv, I would like to congratulate Mr. Anil, Mr. Ashish, Mr. Amit, and of course, our friend Vijay for coming on this public platform and so boldly uh, being part of this solution. You, five of you actually may be beginning a revolution in our country. Because that means you don't understand business because you do more of surgeries and on the uh, lighter I side. And, and absolutely, you are so, a cutting man. So and uh, most of the CEOs are actually governed by 
क्यू एस क्यू टी एंड इट इज नॉट द मूवी कयामत से कयामत तक बट अ लाइफ जर्नी ऑफ क्वार्टर से क्वार्टर तक ऑब्जेक्टिव एंड इन सेंस दे है all these things take a little back seat well, so let me just quarter means something else <laughs> so, okay. Rati, so if so, i if i may yes, anil what i think i got disturbed because yeah. of the the bandwidth, bandwidth issue yeah. so anil you you might want to switch off your video you know it it improves the you know sometimes it helps audio quality yeah, yeah. so we normally suggest you should use webex but Wonderful marketing. We will take that. Next, next, next program will be on Webex Anil, sponsored by Anil. So take it on the national channel. Absolutely. So the the, the second thing is I, I what I find is that you know the the teams are much larger, so you get different perspectives from different sure. countries. You have cross-functional teams. You know, in usually solving any problem, you're you're looking at cross-functional teams, and also I see that. in in companies like ours there's a lot of focus on diversity so i think generally it stimulates a different level of thinking the other important uh, aspect is emotional and mental support which is also required you know there were a couple of projects that we did recently one was we supported youth line in new zealand and youth line actually supports um, the youth it's a suicide line and helps in suicide prevention and they weren't able to deal with the huge influx of calls that they were getting at this time and we also supported in japan a line called tell you know you in japan uh, you nobody speaks english or not many people speak in that's not the common language so for the english speaking population there's a helpline called tell so these are the other things that i see that there is more focus on mental and emotional support at these times in uh, in the other countries and other organizations there and also a lot of education on safe practices so i would i would round it up by saying that wonderful ashish you were saying so, something yeah so no thanks thanks rajiv i i think you you know you make a very interesting point and uh, you know so anil, anil was talking about you know sort of sharing best practices um, and i i I'll, i'll start because you know we uh, you know uh, i'm i'm trying to learn more and more so metlife uh, you know just for information is is the first us insurer uh, which is uh, which is you know uh, which is carbon neutral and this is the second year that they have signed and and, and they have big uh, you know plans on esg goals uh, environment and, and and social goals uh, including you know sort of five you know planting 5 million trees uh, you know a, a target on greenhouse gas emissions you know etc so uh, i think you know multinationals for sure can bring in some best practices and see and i i can tell you you know in uh, you know starting from all of these going into even investments which companies would you invest so you only invest in green companies uh, how do you impact your supply chain uh, you know you engage with uh, you know supply chain partners you know who are who also support uh, green initiatives you know etc so absolutely uh, you make a very good point uh, you know that we can learn from uh, our you know global partners and uh, implement you know here urgently thanks ashish uh, amit let me just ask you a little blunt question and i want a equally blunt answer from you but before that let me just give you a little background Dr Arvind was talking about that we talk about ambient air quality but the indoor air quality is equally bad and actually it has been found not in indian research but american research that it is 2 to 5 times more bad as compared to the outdoor air quality and that is why when we are sitting in offices we all suffer but recently when i was talking with uh, school and college students i did a bit of calculation in saket there is a restaurant which says that we'll give you pure oxygen at the rate of 299 rupees for 15 minutes of pure oxygen now if we were to buy this oxygen just the like the way we buy water as a personal solution to a public problem we buy a bottle of water maybe in future we may have to carry the cans of pure oxygen but if i go by that simple calculation of 299 rupees for 15 minutes of oxygen and that's the rate fixed for a family of four and every member of the family of four lives a life of average 80 years to my calculation the family will have to only spend only 
three hundred and thirty-five crores twenty-six lakhs for their life of eighty years. That amount, three hundred and thirty-five crores twenty-six lakhs. Blah blah blah. Now the question is, if that is something which does not shake us up, and we will never corporate India would never pay that kind of salary and incentives, etc. To that tune, to only buy the oxygen. Rest other things comes later. So here on this panel, we have illustrious panelists, leading panelists, thought leaders. But then India is huge and humongous. Blunt question: What has not changed for corporate India, and how will they be affected in case they don't change? No, Rajiv, and to give you a blunt answer, look, this has already started. I don't know if uh, people read these stories, but Tokyo has oxygen bars. You know, I was in Aspen a couple of years back. I actually had went to an oxygen bar and experienced how all this. So this is going to happen. Unfortunate reality. And the reason is corporations are learning mostly slowly, especially in India. And you know, and this is uh, something uh, which the whole world is taking notice. It's a global problem. Last year, for the first time after hundred years of you know, uh, you know that the capitalism saying that look, the only social responsibility of business is to make profit. Last year, for the first time, hundred and eighty U.S. CEOs got together. The big companies, Apple, Microsoft, signing that we need to start thinking about all stakeholders, including citizens, not just shareholders. Now, this is the change. But let me tell you that there is still lip service happening around the world. Harvard Business School last month published a report, and this is very important for everyone to hear, publishing just the environment costs of 1,800 companies, including, I'll give you some real Indian examples. The study showed that out of these 1,700 odd companies which were profitable, if we just took the environment cost, one of the four externalities, one of the four costs, 25% of the global leading corporate will have full profits wiped out, full profits. One third of them will have 25% or more profits wiped out. Give, let me give you two examples in India. Reliance Industries with four and a half billion dollar of net profits has seven and a half billion dollar of environment costs. So if Reliance Industry was to embrace impact accounting today, where that might go is up to you. Tata Power, which is 350 million of profit, has $130 billion of environment costs, second most polluting company after NTPC, which is $140 billion in just environment costs. So when Indian companies talk about a little bit of CSR here, it's lip service. Most of them have no clue what is their environment cost, and they do not have ways and means of calculating it. What this brings me to is, I think the blunt answer that you're looking for and needs to be out there is businesses and investors are learning far too slowly in India. And I think it took a pandemic like this for them to realize and start sitting up and taking notice that environment and sustainability risk is a business and investment risk. When this gets drilled around into everyone's conscience, people will act differently and only when the markets punish them. So when people will know that the shareholders are actually poorer than they are showing and Danone actually just published it. So, you know, Danone is a 20 billion euro food company. They just published for 2019 carbon adjusted earning per share. It took an Emmanuel Feber to be bold to say, I actually earn 30% less than my financial earning per share if I just accounted for carbon. But he also said by 2025, I'll be carbon neutral. And he showed his carbon adjusted EPS is growing at a faster rate than financial EPS. The day India's laws will force our companies to show it to do impact accounting and show impact adjusted weighted earning per share and markets can value it. Only then co corporates will truly learn. Till then we have to live with the impact washing, green washing and a little bit of marketing pitch. So that is the unfortunate reality. Wonderful, wonderful, Amit. And if I were to use the punchline of a burger company, that would be, I'm loving it. I'm loving the way things are taking shape, but the time's running out. I wish we had more time allocated. Just 10 more minutes left. So let me just switch the question. When you are talking about the impact part of it, my question to Anil, Rajiv and Ashish straight away would be, how do we ensure that clean air becomes an integral part 
of the organization's vision and mission because 25,000 times a day your employee breathes and in case he doesn't get the right quality of clean air, what are we doing as a corporate India? How do we ensure we put clean air as part of the vision and mission and ensure that at any cost this gets delivered? Anil Ashish Rajiv. Okay, let me take it first. Sure. So I don't know whether it, whether it's going to be part of the vision and mission because it's like a fundamental right. You're absolutely you know, right. That you should be able to breathe. It's a fundamental right. Absolutely. So it should be there. And therefore, companies need to take the appropriate steps, retrofitting in most cases, because first of all, understanding the problem, like was just explained, and retrofitting appropriately, the younger generation is going to expect that they will be able to breathe comfortably. You know, you have an example of Apple, their stock price, when they talked about correlating it with eco initiatives went up and they announced it in July 20 and you can see the correlation apart from their, their performance, of course. And uh, there's so many little things that companies can do. For instance, when you, when you adopt digital, you travel less, you're, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, reorganizing going on in terms of the number of people who need to come to the office and the number of people who can work from home. And we know that the productivity factors are high, even if people work from home. Uh, companies can look at renewables, they can look at uh, the energy costs. Uh, they can certainly look at uh, using, um, you know, technologies like RPA, cutting your paper consumption. Uh, just a simple thing like carpooling. For instance, you know, Uber Pool did the study and they found that there's huge savings, not only in the number of liters of fuel, but in the kilometrage and the carbon footprint. Supply chain related savings, just by looking at the optimal paths to take and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, goods transported, they're, they're looking at it appropriately. Just to give you an example, if you look at India, um, when, we, when we transport coal, 60% of that goes through the railways and 50% of the coal that is transported is not combustible, which okay. means if we removed it and sent it, and if 60% of the carriage is happening through the railways, you can imagine just one action, thousands of crores that will be saved just by transporting combustible part of coal. Sure. Back Time's you, running Rajiv. out. Rajiv, uh, would you like to add something to this, please? Yeah, quickly, uh, well said, uh, Anil. Uh, just a couple of things. Like I said earlier, it's a substitution uh, methodology which industry must adopt to finding the solutions to the uh, consumables. Like, for example, instead of using petroleum-based in auto sector or in our company, we use a lot of petroleum-based solutions for, for manufacturing purpose. Could we have changed it to a water-based? Answer is yes, the substitution was found and way back in 90s, we changed. There is a zero effluent, there is a zero uh, petroleum uh, usage uh, in the industry today. Similarly, when, when we are lo looking at a fuel usage like boilers or uh, generators and all, we started with boilers with coal. I still remember in 80s. And by the way, I am a trained safety professional also from Central Labor. So I understand it from 80s itself. The, the question is moving from coal to furnace oil. Now we have switched over to the gas based. Sure. Basically, the directionally, the industry can definitely contribute by finding the solutions which are contributing to reducing the pollution. That is the responsibility we have to take. Thanks, thanks, Rajiv. Uh, a quick bite from Ashish, please, before I move to Vijay with a new so, question. Th thanks, thanks, Rajiv. Uh, so you know, uh, I, I can tell you, uh, it's uh, you know, while I volunteered for this, it's definitely shaken me up a, a bit more than I anticipated. Um, that was the intent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the the good thing is, you know, as I said, you know, we've started some engagement already on uh, you know what can we do as a company, and you know, people spoke about it, so I'm not going to cover. Uh, it has, you know, health impacts. It has financial impact, as you know, Amit very eloquently spoke about. Uh, for me, as an insurance company, as you can understand, Rajiv, uh, not only our employees, but uh, you know, for all it our makes customers, sense that the customers don't fall sick for you. Uh, That's more profitability and, for you. 
and and live forever absolutely <laughs> uh, keep paying my premiums absolutely so, so honestly for us as an insurance company we will absolutely want to participate and see uh, you know and and be be a contributor in this journey thanks ashish uh, let me just quickly invite vijay to speak on this because we are talking a lot about artificial intelligence so what kind of a solutions could be there in the offing which could mitigate the kind of bad impact air pollution is actually creating for india and maybe uh, after vijay anil you could also add something to that please thank okay. you maybe being the last maybe i can leave some lasting impressions i think you always for, make an everlasting impression vijay rest for, assured for instance for instance i came prepared with some solution because i knew that you know this is going to be more solution and outcome focused so for instance in april this year that is the peak of the pandemic crisis there was a news that residents in the city of jalandhar were able to see the dholadhar mountains which is a part of the himalayas because of cleaner air caused by less pollution and in october just 6 months down the situation was reversed so people are gradually returning to the new normal lives and i'm scared about it because when the new normal comes what happens is the same old fashion same old mindset but that needs to be reversed as well so the new normal means on road vehicles are increasing because of safety and hygiene issues industries and manufacturing again activity resuming and with the festive months of diwali especially diwali and firecrackers knocking the door it's only natural that air pollution is in, going to increase at a break it's a break break next space so the result is the low level of air pollution and that we witnessed a few months back is now slowly disappearing so that's what if we need to go by the news our capital city new delhi is already showing signs of increasing air pollution this is as as per the research done latest one by the bbc and this only means a greater possibility of the spread of virus this is a major challenge according to the epidemiologists and doctors this is going to happen if we don't do not take action right now in fact many of us believe that with the winters approaching the scene is going to be worse in delhi and of course the rest of the country so the problem is large in in terms of artificial intelligence as you mentioned therefore we are aware that the impact of air pollution is going to rise be be deadly the covid-19 patients across the country is risen now we are seeing some numbers falling but the challenge is how do we combat the situation i have had three two three issues to look at two three lenses to look at whole thing from a perspective of monitoring and the second m is what we call measuring the third is mitigation and that's the reason why we did a study and i'm sure due to paucity of time we cannot but i think 30 artificial seconds will yeah artificial intelligence and iot based devices and monitoring uh, portable monitoring stations a project which we are working on right now where we can have a localized monitoring station which will give you the right precise amount of data and analytics which could be then put into the system the system gets alerted the authorities get alerted and on a gps mechan and on a basic basis of the gps you are getting actually the right data fed into the system the authorities are going to take action both corporates in built environment outside environment all the authorities corporate and india uh, these uh, the government authorities could take some real data in their hands and take some real time actions to re- either stop vehicles either stop work construction work going on or take maybe do do kind of take any action in terms of carbon tax or penalties or whatever it is so i think this is very urgent unless we take some radical actions on these things i think we are not going to do that thanks we a lot vijay sorry already, we are rushing already, on this we already yeah. on the we are already on the work maybe as we go forward in a few days time we will be able to develop that prototype where we will be able to share with the industry and more other people uh, wonderful thank you so much vijay anil very quick one or two pointers from you vis a vis ai times absolutely out so in terms of ai of course i think there are lots of developments going on and um, essentially you are able to predict demand so even if you looked at let's say any industry take take retail for instance you are able to predict demand you are able to link it with manufacturing you're therefore making sure that only the goods that require to travel you are able to predict demand across countries and move it across so there's no wastage and uh, finally plan efficient routes so i think artificial intelligence is taking shape the issue is where all we can put it to use but uh, if i have a minute let me give you one more example 
uh, rather than talk about just artificial intelligence, let me tell you about IoT. We did this project with the with the with the government. You know, they have hundred smart cities, and we're monitoring all the indices, whether it be traffic or whether it be energy or waste or surveillance or smart parking. But all these, all this information from the hundred cities goes to what is called an Indian Urban Observatory, which is in the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. And let me tell you. they have looked at all the indices in smart cities and they have finally homed in on three that need immediate improvement the first is mobility is traffic yeah second is water yep and uh, you might be happy to know the third is environment so we're monitoring it in 100 smart cities to make a big difference across india thank you so much we all need to be happy that environment clean air especially has to come into the focus this has been a phenomenal day friends people from the corporate world coming forward talking straight taking responsibility giving commitment in terms of what the corporate india should be contemplating thinking working together and with the medical fraternity and corporate india coming together we feel that times to come things would improve these dialogues will continue happening and lanka foundation is committed to that the entire team is committed to that time now for me to close the session but before that i must thank some of our partners all india management association national hrd network national institute of personnel management shriram college of commerce center for green initiatives shriram college of commerce and from specially the faculty from srcc dr simrit kaur the principal rachna jawa and sudhanshu who have been actually very very helpful in terms of making sure that lot of participation comes also from the students and i must thank my team Dr. Arvind Kumar, especially Dr. Bilal Benasif, Dr. Harshvardhan Puri, Abhishek Kumar, Matushri Shetty, Charu Dhingra, Kritika, Hamid, Sadhar, Jodit, Dr. Lenny, Neha, Shalini, and Abhishek, who have worked from behind the scene in terms of making sure that this program is actually on dot. My request to all the participants would be to click the link. fill up the feedback form give your information vis a vis your name and email id so that your e certificate could also be mailed to you and finally special thanks to all the participants for patiently listening giving your reactions giving your comments and also sending your questions some of those questions i could mix and match but i'm sorry i couldn't take all the questions because the discussion was happening so intense that i could not accommodate more questions into that maybe next time we continue with the same panel we continue with the same discussion and cover much more point time to close now thank you very much namaskar from lankier foundation god bless you all keep breathing well keep working towards breathing well because it is your right and also your responsibility thank you namaste mm-hmm.